Video Trade. This is Don Kaufman. December 2nd, 2022. Just about 35 minutes left inside of your trading week with the S&P futures. Well, for the most part, they are massively unchanged. But this weekend's update is going to focus specifically on are the markets trading in the upside down? I'll explain that and much more here on, again, the weekend update. As I was saying moments ago is uh, the S&Ps. Look at this. For the most part, they've got their way all the way back to unchanged. One of the first points that I want to make, it's not so much reviewing some of the past activity of this week, because I'm going to tell you right now, the entire trading week, okay? was a whole lot of nothingness followed by a few sheer terrifying moments. It's complete and utter data dependency. All right, and what that basically means is we get a data drop like this morning, right? What do we have over here? The employment situation. You would think this was a huge miss, but it's not a huge miss. The data came out, the employment situation beats what does that basically mean? Well, if you wanted to look at the numbers, 263,000 jobs, yada, yada, yada. There was 200,000 jobs expected. The market absolutely tanks. And this is, first of all, what I'm talking about with data dependency, that basically the market's gone boop, completely and utterly dead other than for a data point. But look back, if you will, at a 30, again, this is a 30-day, 30 30-day 30 one hour. And when I talk about markets doing absolutely nothing, this is exactly what I'm referencing. And I've been talking about that now for, for days. You realize that the market's been channeling, okay, roughly speaking from 39.50, okay, to the upper edge of this is like 40.50. So a hundred point move from like, you know, from high to kind of low just recently inside of the S&P futures. But <laughs> it's been doing that in the midst of right around a 20 VIX. So you all of a sudden you're like, well, what does that mean? It means, well, we should be rocking a lot more than that in terms of price action, and we're not. But then seemingly out of nowhere, okay, the data dependency changes everything. And what that basically means is, hey, look, within three hours, within three hours, we have weeks worth of move that has transpired inside of three hours. This is a move literally from the 39.50 straight shot in three hours to 40.80. Okay, the entire span of that range and then some, lo and behold, all inside of basically one minute this morning, we were actually trading at the level of, oh, let's just, let's just round it to 4080. We dropped down to 4,000 even, another, you know, 70, 80 point move inside of basically, okay, a minute or two. Again, this type of data dependency, and before I really dig into this weekend's update here, this type of data dependency, this is not good for traders. If you take directional bias in this marketplace, I know that some people are like cheering, you know, some of the reports that are come out. Yeah, man, I knew CPI was going to come in a little bit softer. And when I say that, I'm, I'm just poke, kind of poking fun because there's always somebody that's on the right side of it, right? Yeah, I knew CPI was going to take the market higher. The market explodes higher. All right. And then of course, yeah, I knew the Fed was going to, and the market explodes higher. And then all of a sudden it's a good jobs report and you get absolutely decimated. Okay. That's what I kind of call like living in the upside down because uh, what is the upside down? First of all, that's a little bit of a reference to uh, Stranger Things okay, and uh, Netflix. Uh, listen, I've mentioned the upside down time and again on some of these weekend updates, but we're literally living in the upside down where, again, really good things okay, are really, really bad for the marketplace. What's a good thing? The job situation is still pretty good. How did the market react to that? Absolutely terribly. But don't worry, it's possibly rallying back up. Eh, again, this might be more gamma than it is anything other than that. But when I talk about you know living in the upside down, again, it just basically means bad data, good for the market. Good data, bad for the marketplace. Okay, and when you start thinking about what the Fed said throughout the course of this week, and I'll cruise back over here to this uh, this 30 day one hour, the Fed actually made dovish comments that they're actually going to possibly cool off and only do a 50 basis point hike. Okay, even a 50 basis point hike is still really bad for the market. The market's like, yes, okay, we're going to be less screwed with a 50 basis point hike and it rallies. And you got to think about that for a second, because again, for all of this volatility to end, and that's, that's one of the reasons I'm talking about it, like for all this volatility to come to a conclusion, 
maybe we have to actually start trading. Okay. Well, you know, when things are good, the market actually moves up. And when things are bad, they move down. Let me give you an example of that and something I'm actually going to talk a little bit about later. Like, for instance, Costco. Okay. There's a lot of people, again, they have this, this dependency at this point on the Fed. The Fed will save us. Okay. But this data dependency, in my mind, is already starting to come apart like the entire like logic of data dependency where all of a sudden cpi comes out we explode higher where cpi comes out we you know we rip lower the fed actually says something the markets explode higher off of the fed it's rapidly diminishing and i'm going to tell you apart like the entire logic of this the data dependency and the logic of the upside down okay all of a sudden bad is bad Look no further than something like Costco, okay? And this is the kind of stuff that's gonna to start to resonate throughout the entire marketplace. Costco, same store sales, okay? Is actually their online sales, swing and a miss. This is really almost like a four standard deviation move based on like uh, the, the implied volatility of the week. This is like a four standard deviation move to the downside. So Costco is roughly trading, you know, let's call it 530, 540 one day, the very next day or two days later, it's trading 495. Uh, if you actually look at this from an expected move point of view, when you're wondering like, you know, standard deviation, so forth, an expected move point of view, it's huge. It's an absolutely uh, magnificent move to the downside inside of Costco. Okay. But you've got to start looking at stuff like this because this is when bad really is bad. Okay. By the way, Costco coming out with earnings next week, and you better believe that I'm going to be discussing a little bit about trading some of the, uh, well, anything involving retail right now. I want a piece of that action because Costco isn't doing well. Costco's just kind of like a bellwether. I mean, Costco is like the litmus test, if you will, I think for retail. And seeing the sell side activity in there, I mean, that's about as intimidating as it gets. But the reason I wanted to mention this is because, again, this is where all of a sudden Costco doesn't seem very reliant on the Fed. Right, the Fed ain't helping them because uh, even though they're only going to hike by 50 basis points, uh, you know Costco still absolutely tanked and continues to actually see some sell side activity. You got to start to look at stuff like this because all of a sudden, if we start to go into bad earnings, bad will be bad. Okay, bad things happening in the marketplace are going to be bad, and then all of a sudden, okay, then you get like you know bad jobs report could flip over and also be bad for the marketplace. There's just there's not a lot of bright spots in here when you're living in the upside down, and I hope that that makes sense to you because it's mind bending when you realize how distorted we have become. When again, you know, really good news. I'll give it to you. The jobs number 263. You know, uh, if you believe it, <laughs> if you believe it, there's a lot of conversation about that, that 263, the employment situation. But if you believe it, that's actually a great number. Okay. It is. It's a great number. Good. And the marketplace absolutely tanks. We got to get out of the situation. You got to get out of the upside down and living in the upside down. As long as we're there, volatility is going to be here. And I want you guys to know that the next thing I'm actually going to say about living in the upside down before we actually get into the deeper update here is this this crap is really really hard to take directional bias in i'm telling you right now this is when you want to just sell premium get back reduce risk period okay sell premium get back reduce risk build a nice little inventory here of options and so forth okay a little option inventory some of the mes some of the es some of the s and p's okay look just building a nice option inventory, letting the theta roll in. That means selling premium, letting some of that premium roll in and uh, not trying to get run over by phenomenal moves. Because the bottom line is, right, it's only going to take like once. You're going to be on the wrong side of one of these moves and it's over if you are going to try to actually trade directionally bias through these moves. The bottom line is you just got to take define risk shots be bullish be bearish be willing to put a few dollars at risk and if it goes against you it goes against you that's it you get long or short futures in here you're gonna get smoked because again right now the data dependency has actually been pushing markets a little higher all right yeah until it doesn't and uh, again this is it's an incredibly dangerous time if you guys hadn't seen it was actually an article that came out a multitude of articles that came out Literally today, Bridgewater Capital, Bridgewater Capital, one of the biggest hedge funds, you know, probably one of the more renowned funds. They gave back all their profitability and they were wildly profitable this year. All their profitability was given back inside of the last two months. Yeah. What's happened the last two months? Data dependency. OK, that's as soon as we went into this, you know, this fit of rage of just data dependency, data dependency, it'll rip anybody apart. CTAs and so forth, they get smoked in this marketplace. So I'm telling you, you sell premium right now, you get back, you reduce risk, you do stuff like we're doing right now, like catapult, 
Why? Because it's working. The bottom line is this crap actually works. We're financing directional bias by selling premium. Okay. And that is what works in this marketplace. All right. Onward and upward over there. So done talking about the data dependency and the upside down. Of course, uh, Jerome Powell, Fed goes dove. I don't think the Fed definitely went dovish. The Fed just basically said, look, it's a good time to maybe see like how much damage have we really inflicted? I mean, that's what they basically said. How much damage have we inflicted? I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I'll raise 50 basis points, okay, on December 14th, and we'll just see how much damage happens after that, huh? Okay, let's let's call it quits after that. You know, again, there's weeks worth of moves that are happening in minutes here. But here's the next crazy thing. What are we going to do for like next week? You know, what's what's the uh, the third or fourth act of this? Because next week, when I say next week, all right, there's nothing actually happening. There's like, there's no data really coming out next week the week after that which is december like 13th actually the week actually starts december 12th but december 13th is the next major data point and how ironic okay the data point uh comes out that cpi cpi is coming out december 13th and of course the fed actually is uh releasing their next announcement on the 14th so uh yeah you got that going for you but that's the next major data that's going to be coming out. So the market's actually going to have to latch on to something else this next week, but uh, don't worry. I'm sure there'll be a story out there. Also, I want to give you a little bit of a sector update here. So markets, okay, where are they? Where are they in the week? Orientation here. Let's take a quick look at the SPX, the mother of all products. One of the coolest things to discuss probably this week, and it is, it's really cool, is that, um, hey, look, the SPX, as I said, the mother of all products, we had approximately plus or minus a $76 move, right? So in doing sector updates here, and of course, I also, you know, discuss the future outlook of the SPX, but just to show you price action here, the SPX stayed, okay, inside for the most part at $76 range, all right? That was the expected move. So the expected move is basically 76 bucks. Basically on Monday, we came down. How far? Almost 76 bucks. We clipped very mildly outside of it, okay? Clipped very mildly outside of it, and all of a sudden, Jerome Powell comes in, bam! Where are we Thursday? Upper edge of the expected move. So you go $76 lower, $76 higher, another $76 higher, come down $76, right? Because that's exactly $76 there, and where are we right now? Well, the week will finish mildly higher. I mean, net, net, the week actually started in a you know, get my mouse directly on it. The week basically started at 40.25. We're going to finish the week just about, uh, oh, let's call it 30 handles higher. It ain't over. <laughs> it ain't over. There's 20 minutes left. Come on, we can sell off and have the uh, the week massively unchanged. But again, this is, you know, well, what have we done? What have you done for me lately? And the market answer to that is absolutely nothing. All we're doing is just channeling back and forth over here, as I said, you know, somewhere right around this 40, 50, 39, 50. And again, we explode higher, explode lower. You got to love that. So the SPX didn't do a whole lot, but wait, there's more. Let's actually go to the QQQ and go to auto expected moves. If you take a look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ, okay, is actually propagating some gains on the week unquestionably. But this is one that's actually going to surprise you because I talked about this expressly in last weekend's update. Take a look at none other than the XLF. The XLF, of course, the financials. Financials, mildly lower on the week. That's one that a lot of people didn't see coming. And I'm telling you, okay, we're playing sector rotation game right now. So what's actually keeping the S&Ps in a relatively tight range is one week you've got like tech down, okay, and like financials up. Right. So last week, last week was the week for what? Last week's all about like the financials in here. So let's actually highlight that right here. See the financials to the upside. OK, what did what did tech do largely last week? And if you look at tech, we'll zoom into last week. OK, last week, tech didn't do very much. Finished the week just a skosh higher. OK, this week, tech's a little bit higher. But wait, OK, also put the energy sector in there because and again, this is some pretty interesting stuff. Last week, the energy sector massively unchanged. This week, the energy sector, okay, very close to the lower edge of the expected move, about more than halfway home to the lower edge of the expected move. So we're all of a sudden, we're playing like whack-a-mole with the sector rotation game. Keep this in mind because it's one of the things that 
I trade a lot of this. Obviously, I'm actually short in the uh, in the financials. I'm actually short in the energy sector right now, okay? But I've actually lightened up my short position specifically inside of the NASDAQ and the QQQ. Why? Because, hey, listen, you see these sectors starting to rotate, okay? It is what it is. Nevertheless, the S&Ps at this point are going to finish the week. Probably just a mild, again, mild move higher in the week. So that's kind of your sector updates. And the reason I'm going through that is it's going to lead itself very nicely into get your trade on this week's profits and losses. As I was saying moments ago, I am carrying some short positions still, of course, in some uh, some major sectors. My biggest short positions right now, as I said moments ago, are in financials. Of course, they're in the energy sector. Eh, they're still actually holding up fairly well, but I would still anticipate, again, that financials, energy are going to be weak. Weak relative, of course, to uh, to NASDAQ, and we'll see if that continues to kind of play a role next week. But in terms of get your trade on, all right, this week's profit and losses. First of all, one of the things that's worked a lot for me, okay, lately is just covering short premium. So I'm actually going to go back here to the forward slash ES, right? This is just seven days, not a lot of order history in here. What, what was I doing throughout the course of the week? You know what? I opened a position of the 3,200 puts. I opened the 3,200 puts, but everything else I did this week to close, to close, to close. All of these, okay, net, net, or over a 50% gain. And that's exactly what I try to do. I said, I'm just trying to sell premium. If you want to see the full data on here, okay, for those of you that really want to geek out, look, all right, there's your 4650s. They're open for 1050, closed for 525, okay? Here, you actually have what? The, uh, the 4590s open for 1225, closed for six bucks, over a 50% gain. Okay, here's the 3140 puts open for 2050, closed for what? 1025, over a 50% gain. I just go back out and just keep whacking it out there. You know, it's premium, it's premium, it's premium. You know, if I can collect uh, 50%, I'll take that all day long. That's one of the things that's really been working. Another thing that I have actually embarked upon a bit this week was uh, a couple of uh, just, you know, intermittent scalps. Okay, for those of you that have no idea, this is like intraday trades. One worked, one didn't. But uh, the way I actually tee up some of the intraday trades, I'm going to go to the QQQ. Let me just show you, for instance, the last like seven days in here in the Qs. Might be a little confusing, but because uh, I know I had some other positions in here as well, but I'll kind of highlight this. Okay, this is a QQQ scalp right here. The position is I opened up the 286 puts, opened up the 286 puts relatively early in the day. Uh, late in the day, I actually closed the 286 puts, opened them for a buck 23, closed them for 414. You're like, it's a home run. And it was a home run. By the way, this other position, that's just a closing position where I was actually making a couple of bucks. Okay. But um, nevertheless, this is one in its absolute home run, opening for a buck 23, closing for 414. Uh, but at the exact same time, no problem saying this. If you take a look at my position, uh, I did one today. Okay, This other one on the 28th does not count. That's actually a, a closing position. But this opening position literally today, I'll go back like literally like one day. I opened to the 404 puts. Those 404 puts, what are they going to do today? They're going to expire. So I'm going to lose a buck 13 in them. It's okay, right? Because I'm going out there and I'm literally trying to hit the cover off the ball. But you don't even have to be right. You don't even have to be right, okay? But 30% of the time when you're having returns that significant. All right. So again, all I'm trying to do at this point, sell some premium, cover short premium, a uh, couple of intraday trades over there. Okay. And then I'm actually opening up some new trades and have been opening up new trades. One of the ones that uh, I'll continue to kind of uh, discuss over here, I'll start actually with Starbucks. Okay. I'm building a short position inside of Starbucks. All right. This is an actual short position in the stock. That's not necessarily okay for everybody, but I am actually shorting stock in here and I shorted a bit more in terms of Starbucks. Now, Starbucks, it's really, um, Year to date, it's down about 10% on a year to date basis. It's kind of outperforming the S&Ps. This is not going to be a short duration position. This is going to be a longer duration position. Think of a short position in Starbucks, if you will, okay, as an investment to the downside. It's something like, hey, listen, I may not bring it up on every single weekend update, but yes, I am actually building a short position inside of Starbucks because it, for me, okay, is like retail is in trouble right now. And I think that the consumer is in trouble right now and places that they're going to cut back unequivocally are going to be places like Starbucks, right? So there is some fundamental analysis, you know, involved in here. This has nothing to do with the technical. The only thing on the side of the technicals I like over here is the fact that it's just smashing through the upper edge of the expected move this week. It's like a two deviation move. I love to step in and actually short at extremes and that people, that is an extreme. What have they done? Absolutely nothing. So I'm actually building a true short position inside 
out of Starbucks in the stock itself. The other one I've actually built, and this was today, was an XLP. Okay, so an XLP, a little bit of a pop to the upside. If you take a look at auto expected moves here, last week hits the upper edge of the expected move. This week, actually hitting the upper edge of the expected move, people. Okay, two, three weeks in a row. Two, three weeks in a row. Like this one at pretty much counts. It hit the upper edge. This one just missed. This one's outside the expected move. This one just missed. I mean, really, technically, this one didn't hit, but you have eh, two out of the last, like, you know, three weeks hitting the upper edge. And what? You know, out of the last four weeks, three out of the last four hit the upper edge of the expected move. It's enough to actually cause me to want to build a short position. This is 35 days out. If obviously you can see our open interest uh, or, or our volume actually building, there's almost no open interest in these weeklies. The weeklies were just recently listed. So, uh, hey, listen, it is what it is. Some 2,700 contracts that uh, we're presently trading in there. It's a short position. It's got the next 35 days to have some degree of a pullback. All right. So those are some of the trades, obviously, that uh, we're doing here. Again, get your trade on, few profits, few losses on the week. Most of what I did this week in those choppy, wild moves, just covering some premium. Cares and you're making 50% in selling options premium. I'll tell you what, it's boring, but that crap works when you have explosive moves. All right, last but definitely not least, as we discuss each and every week here at Theo Trade, again, back to the expected move. So we saw Mr. Toad's wild ride down 76 bucks. Okay, up like, you know, 160 bucks, down 76 bucks. It's just wild. Again, we're going to finish the week probably mildly higher here. There's still about uh, 14 minutes to go to the cash close. We're going to finish the week mildly higher. But one of the things that really kind of resonates with me, look at the size of these moves. It's ridiculous. Like this expected move. I don't care if the expected move says 76 bucks. I don't care that we closed inside the expected move. I care about the sheer fact that how can you make 150 plus point moves? Okay, I mean, from low to high over here, we're talking like, again, 140, 150 points in a move on a week. The entire week is expecting $76, right? What are we expecting now? Next week, let's go exactly seven days out. Realize the expected move has dropped to 65 bucks. I'm gonna tell you right now, I would actually buy premium in the shorter duration. Okay, I would actually buy premium in the shorter duration okay, and finance that by selling longer duration premium because the volatilities are substantially higher the further out you go in time. Skew is also much bigger further out you go in time. That's something I'm going to be discussing okay, this coming week on Theo Trade is, listen, you've dropped down to like a 14 and a half ball, $65 expected move. And the market's not even closed yet, but a $65 expected move okay, after seeing what? Okay, after seeing, for example, an 80 point move effectively inside of one minute. For the most part, okay, I don't like it. I don't have to like it. I don't even want to like it. Well, that expected move inside of the SPX this coming week seems far, far too low. I don't usually go on a limb and get that specific, but I think it's critically important. That is one more reason that I think, yeah, markets are trading in the upside down. It is completely, okay, inverse out there. And this, this stuff, this situation, it's coming to a head and it needs to end. With that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in each and every week here to Theo Trade. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye bye.